see how cheaped out and you don't have the uh, remote mics anymore. Um, the, if you looked at the uh, schedule, uh, the title of the seminar is something that I'm somewhat uniquely qualified to talk about, and that is the rise and fall of Illinois pinball. Um, show of hands, how many people are familiar with Illinois pinball? That eh, probably would have been easier to say who hasn't been familiar with Illinois pinball. Uh, I'll give a little bit of a background on it because I know there are a couple of you who haven't uh, experienced them. They've been out of it for a little while. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, I've been talking all day at the uh, booth, so it's a little bit uh, fluttered. Uh, Illinois Pinball was a company that Gene Cunningham started in the 1990s, basically. And it started its rise when Capcom went out of business and Gene Cunningham, through a certain promoter that used to be at this show, found a cache of parts in California at Capcom USA and they were the pinball, the remnants of the pinball parts of Capcom Pinball and Gene Cunningham went out and bought those parts, uh, I think it was about $30,000 he spent and it was uh, uh, all the inventory of, of Capcom Pinball, board sets, etc. and that was the late 90s. And then in 1999 there was a company called Williams Pinball and they went out of business and they sent out a brochure looking for bids on their pinball, I would call it uh, parts. Uh, it wasn't that they were selling, they, they weren't selling the pinball division. What they were doing is selling the pinball parts and they also were selling the use of the intellectual properties of Williams Pinball. So they sent out a packet listing what the bidders we're going to get, and they were basically sealed bids. And in the meantime, Gene Cunningham uh, was active with the Capcom parts and had uh, produced a game, and we were trying to remember the name of it. Uh, Lloyd probably knows what it was. Uh, I think it was the pool player, the pool player. And Gene took a break shot pinball, if you're familiar with that, a Capcom break shot, modified it and called it uh, the pool player. And it was going to be, he planned to manufacture that. Uh, and he had three of them on display, and I believe it was the AMOA show in Las Vegas. And he had put a bid in for $600,000 for the remnants of Williams Pinball. And while he was at that show, I believe it was that show, um, he got the word that his bid was the one that was selected by Williams Pinball. So he took over the parts inventory of Williams and also in that contract, he got the use of the intellectual properties. And to clarify one thing, the use of intellectual properties means they give him permission to use them he did not have control of the intellectual properties. Um, Planetary Pinball at this time has control over it. They have, and by having control, they can actually allow other people to use the intellectual properties, much like what Gene actually got. Uh, that is one of the uh, misinformation that was out there for a while because everybody thought that Gene Cunningham owned the rights of everything Williams Pinball. He did not. Uh, what he had was simple use. He can make parts using the intellectual properties. So he, um, and that was that was sort of the uh, the rise of Illinois Pinball. So in 2000, he takes over the parts. And there was a story behind that that when he went to inspect the parts, they were on pallets out in the factory at Williams, and they were also. Uh, board sets, uh, PC boards that were in these cabinets, stored in all these cabinets. And when he made the bid for the remnants of Williams Pinball, 
he actually calculated the 600,000 value in those boards alone. So in his mind, he was gonna be able to take all those PC boards, flip those and pay the money that he bought everything for. And I got a list of the parts that they were selling off. And in retail, it was about six to seven million dollars worth of parts. But it was, a, you know, a lot of those parts are brackets that he would still have today if he still had everything. So he pays the money, and then he was, uh, I believe it was the show 2000 Pinball Expo. He had brought uh, out of the Capcom stuff that he got, he got uh, one of the original Big Bang bars, uh, and he had it at the Expo here. And it was right after that expo that he went over to pick up the parts from uh, Williams. And uh, Fred, who's actually here, uh, was assisted in helping move those. They had some cube trucks and they were moving them back and forth to Blooming, Bloomington, Illinois, which I dubbed Blooming Idiot Town, Illinois, but had nothing to do with Gene. It was just, it's a weird town. Um, so they, when they went to get the parts, all the board sets that were in all these cabinets were gone. And Gene was just absolutely crushed. And of course, William's in the contract, but as is, where is. So when he signed the contract, they became the responsibility of Gene Cunningham to secure, and when they disappeared, they disappeared. So that took a a lot of the winds off of the sales, but he still had technically five to six million dollars worth of assets that he got through the parts. To get to a little background on Gene, I'll back up. He made a lot of his money through rental homes uh, in Bloomington, and Bloomington is a is a uh, college town. So he was able to take really run down houses, if you want to call them that, and college kids, the more run down, the better it was for the college kids. That was, they loved that kind of stuff. So he kept buying these rental houses and he had amassed about 100, 110 rental homes that he was renting out. And that's where he was, he really gave, got his uh, income and wealth from. So given that background, he started into the Williams. He got the Williams parts. He bought a compound and it was called Georgiana Drive. He was able to get the postal service to, to name it Georgiana Drive. And he bought a compound that had an A-frame on it and it was a warehouse type building that used to be a church. So we always called it the church building. And also on that same compound, I think it was about seven acres worth. Uh, if you ever went there, uh, those that have been there know the compound I'm talking about. When he originally bought it, it was the church, which was a warehouse, two houses that uh, uh, I wouldn't let my worst enemy's dogs live in. Uh, they were a bit run down. And the A-frame. Gene took some of the rental homes that he had borrowed against those to improve the compound. He built another warehouse so that he could warehouse the Williams parts. And then he'd made another step where he built these mini warehouses uh, that stretched down the driveway on this compound. And when he was building those, he did not, he did not really pay attention to the zoning codes. So he was building them with the plans of renting them out as office space, which he thought he could get $1,000, $1,500 a month for. Turned out that zoning code said it could only be used as storage warehouses. So there he had to go to many warehouses where you're only gonna get three to 400. Well, he leverages a lot of his real estate against building all these buildings. So between 2000, 2003, he's putting a lot of money into this compound. He's got the Williams parts that he got. 
And when they got them to that compound, they were on pallets. They really were not organized. And Gene, for some reason, I, could, I can't speak for him as to why, did not really bring in a, a knowledgeable parts person to go through the parts, organize them in a short period so that they could get them to market. They, he hired his family. Uh, Kim, some of you probably, if you knew of Illinois Pinball, Kim Carter is stepdaughter. He hires her and uh, some of the other family members, and they had no knowledge of business nor pinball. So they're going through these parts and they really don't know what they're looking for. So it took a long time for them to even start to fill any kind of orders. And I always called the period between 2000 and 2004 the darkest days of pinball. And those that were around at that time know what I mean. You could not find a pinball part. You could not find a Williams pinball part. Williams was gone, Gene had all the parts. We're trying to get parts. I was in the business at the time, and at that time I had a shop where we were shopping out games and at one time, I needed an Adams Family ramp to shop out a game, and I couldn't get one. <clears throat> Go on eBay, they're selling for $600 NOS ramps. That was ridiculous. Um, and if you know my background, it was right around that time, I decided, well, I'm not paying $600 for ramps, and I went into manufacturing replacement ramps. So, that's how, so I credit Gene Cunningham for getting me started into the ramp business. So I give him that credit. So between 2000 and 2004, parts were almost impossible to get. Not only myself, but there were people like uh, Alan Meyer, uh, Darren Jacobs, Kerry Stair, and a list of others that started filling the gaps as far as trying to get parts out there for people to keep the machines up. Stern at that time were they were really down. The industry was really as flat as it could get. And it was really on the verge, I think, of, of complete collapse to the point where people were going to get away from the hobby. Uh, fortunately, uh, Gene started to, to come around. A couple of people came into the fold at Illinois Pinball. Uh, for those that were around back then, they, you might remember there was a couple of guys that called them the Bear Cave guys. Um, and they came in under the guise that they were going to help Illinois Pinball get organized. Well, they turned out to really come in there and they were looking out for themselves more than they were Illinois Pinball. Yes, they did help and parts were starting to come out of Illinois Pinball, but I, it turned into a disaster. Uh, at the same time, Gene Cunningham also uh, announced he was going to make Big Bang Bar. He did that in 2001 or 2002, I believe. He decided at Expo, he announced he's going to make Big Bang Bar. And he was going to do that with the parts that he had, basically, that he had gotten through the Capcom deal. So he took the pre-orders and he started producing or going into the manufacturing of the Big Bang Bar. He makes the statement later that he lost six, seven hundred thousand dollars making that Big Bang Bar. To his credit, he did eventually get those games made and everybody that put money down on that game received their game and received a quality game and they got a heck of an investment. I think his sale price was 30, uh, 30, 4,500, 4,500. And of course, I don't think there was one that sold for less than 12,000 after they received it. Um, the finish, the completion of the Big Bang Bar, I believe he started complete, the, the completion of that was between 2005, 2006, Somebody may know better dates than I. Between 2004, July 
I, that's what I was thinking is between 2005, 2006 is when they were complete, started the completion of the runs because Gene had to get the games done before the Rojas uh, regulations kicked in, in in Europe. So there were two, there was a couple of things that were going on at that time. Um, here they were trying to get the Williams parts organized. At the same time, they were trying to get the Big Bang Bar machine made. And Gene was the type of person that did not trust a lot of people. Uh, so he would, he, he relied more on his family than outside people. He, you know, I can go into what he should have done and I bet everybody here who could give their opinion what he should have done with it. The fact is he tried to run it on a skeletal, uh, a skeleton crew, primarily his family, and he's trying to build a game, which was quite an undertaking, and at the same time, organized parts. It ended up that Kim, his stepdaughter, to, for the whole part, took over the parts business. Jeff McAfee came in and, and assisted for a little while, but then, for whatever reason, I'm not going to go into it because it was between Jeff and Gene, they, it didn't work out. I'll just put it that way. Um, it looked for a while that Big Bang Bar was not going to be, it was not going to come to fruition. Uh, but Fred, uh, who also helped with his parts, uh, assisted in getting the game done, and Carrie Stair was pivotal in it as well, and they got it to the finish line. And at that point, when he got that game to the finish line, I would call that the, the peak of Illinois pinball. Oh, the day that pigs flew, yes. The day that pigs flew, that's, uh, I, I don't think Vince is here, but uh, yeah, that was an extension of some of, <laughs> but Gene, to his credit, he got that game done, he got it out the door, so over a period of two to three years, they were shipping those games or people were being able to come pick them up. Uh, the total number, we'll call it 190, it's, it's still, a little bit, some people say it was this number. Gene says it's one number, but it changes every, not every time you talk to him, but it changed quite a bit. But when he was building that Big Bang Bar, the parts part of his business suffered, but there was also another thing that started to take place that began the fall of Illinois pinball. And that goes back to his real estate his rental homes. He was buying these homes that were literally just falling down. And the city of Bloomington did not really have an inspection policy when it came to rental homes. They enacted an inspection policy. And the inspection policy that the council came up with was that rental homes would have to be inspected the owner of the rental home would have to pay, I think it was $25 to the inspector for the inspection. And if they failed inspection, then the owner would have, I believe it was 30 days to get it up to code. And then if they couldn't get it up, they had to have, they had to pay for the second inspection. If it couldn't get up to code, then they had a fine. They had another amount of time to get it up to code. If they couldn't get it up to code, then at, at one point, the home would be condemned and could not be rented out. Uh, and I think, uh, Fred, do you know, do you, were you familiar with the timeline on that? I want to say it was a 30, then 60 day, and it was at that 90 day point, the tenants had a 30 day notice that they had to vacate due to condemnation of the, uh, of the properties. That and Gene said he lost six, seven hundred thousand on Big Bang Bar. That number, yes and no. That was sort of a paper loss because when he made Big Bang Bar, he created a company called Pinball Manufacturing. And Pinball Manufacturing was the company that lost six to seven hundred thousand dollars. 
And the reason was, Pinball Manufacturing was the company that took the money in, the deposits, and then later the, uh, he sent out a letter saying, you've got to send your balance in. Um, so they took the money in, Pinball Manufacturing, but when they bought the parts, they bought the parts from Illinois Pinball. And so the money went from Pinball Manufacturing to Illinois Pinball in a lot of the uh, transactions. So Illinois Pinball actually had an income from it, but on paper, Pinball Manufacturing lost money, but at the same time, the Illinois Pinball actually made money because they sold the parts. Now they did lose money externally because they had to have uh, manufacturers, assembly of manufacturers, they had external vendors making parts and such. So Gene did not make money on the game, but he didn't lose as much as six, seven hundred thousand. I'd put the number closer to a hundred, hundred fifty thousand. Where Gene and Illinois' downfall began was between 2000, 2008. 2005, an important thing took place. Gene's contract with Williams was a five year exclusive use of the intellectual properties. I meant they cannot allow anybody else to use those intellectual properties. In 2005, that exclusive use ended. And I sort of, I, I always dubbed it that Williams rolled up the same swamp and sold it again. What they did is they sold the control of the intellectual properties they put that into a package and they sold that off to Wayne Gillard in Australia, uh, Pim, uh, Mr. Pinball in Australia. So in 2005, now Gene Cunningham no longer had the exclusive use of the intellectual properties. Not only that, he was still a uh, assigned use and not control, whereas Wayne Gillard had control, which meant Gene could make parts, but he could not license other people to make parts, although Gene thought he could, and he sort of got himself in trouble a little bit by trying to do that. He actually tried to assign some rights to me to with the decals on the ramps, and then that's when I found out the dynamics of the intellectual properties. Um, so when Gillard comes into the fray, and those that know Wayne uh, on the forums, he's a bit abrasive uh, and uh, maligned, but I give him credit in a lot of ways that some people don't. Up until 2005, Gene Cunningham had these, the use of these rights, but he really didn't do a lot with them. He made some things. He made uh, KISS play fields, uh, some plastic sets. He was making some cabinet art, but he really wasn't using those intellectual properties to their fullest extent, and primarily because he didn't have the funding to do it. Again, we go back to now he was getting involved with all these inspections of his rental homes at the same time he's building Big Bang Bar. So he neglected, he didn't focus on um, the parts business, which was, I could go into, that's what he should have focused on um, for the sake of Illinois Pinball, the fall of Illinois Pinball. If he had focused on it, I don't believe the fall of Illinois pinball would have taken place as it did. So Wayne Gillard comes in in 2005. Where I give, I actually give Wayne credit, not full credit, but some credit for saving pinball. When he came into it, he motivated Gene, but he also, as abrasive as he was, he got things done. He started making parts. He started getting parts into the market again where the collectors could start getting them. It was no longer those that were working underground didn't have to work underground. They could work with Wayne because Wayne could actually license them to make parts. At the same time, it motivated Gene 
to say, I've got to do something. And at that time, Carrie Stair was working with him on the Big Bang Bar. Carrie approached me and Darren Jacobs to meet with Gene and form an alliance to make parts, help Gene make parts. I was still manufacturing replacement ramps. I was making my own tooling to do that. And at that time, I had been doing it for about four years. So we had a meeting. Uh, Carrie Stair arranged a meeting between Darren Jacobs, myself, and Gene. Um, so we met in Blooming Idiot Town. And we came to a, an agreement that we would make parts under the umbrella of Illinois Pinball. And it was also at that time that it was revealed to me that Gene Cunningham had all the original tools to make the ramps, uh, the thermoformed parts, and also injection tools, which was remarkable because he, he had, it was a little over 200 injection tools, and yet he did not make a single part off any of those tools for three years after he got, he actually rounded them up and brought them back to his building. They just sat there. So in 2005, because Wayne started his alliance with certain people, um, Gene started the alliance with us, and that's how my company got access to the original tools in 2005, and we were starting, we were able to increase the number of products that we were able to put out there because now we had access to these tools and instead of having to put the money and the time into making new tools, we had access to the original tools. Darren Jacobs, uh, if you're not familiar with him, Phoenix uh, Amusements, Phoenix Arcade, he was making the decal sets, the cabinet decal sets. Um, so Gene had, through the purchase of the Williams assets, um, had access, they, in those assets were the original art films. So now Darren had access to the original art films to make the cabinet decals and such, plastic sets as well. And so we were able to increase the number of those parts that were getting out there. Carrie Stair, who was still working with the Big Bang Bar, shortly left because there was a falling out between Gene Cunningham and Carrie about the Big Bang Bar project. You'll have to ask Carrie about that one. Um, so it was myself and Darren Jacobs from 2005 uh, onward making parts using now the original assets of Williams to make those parts. Wayne was able to find, and the, it was something that uh, was somewhat, uh, I don't want to use, uh, I guess, incredibly, um, uh, it was amazing to me that Gene did not take the effort to simply locate the original Williams vendors. As soon as Wayne got control of the rights, the first thing he did was going, he went to the original vendors like Pulse Plastic, Foremost, Northern Precision Plastic. He went to these guys and it turned out a lot of these guys had all these Williams parts stuck in boxes that Williams never picked up. And Wayne immediately was able to snatch those up. So he was able to get parts into the marketplace. He also found some of the vendors that were overseas that were make, uh, making some of the metal parts. So Wayne started making parts, Gene was making parts, and that's when all of a sudden between 2000, after 2005, the people in the, our, our hobby were now able to start getting parts more and more and more. And at the same time, getting into the overall pinball industry, Stern started to turn around and they started making decent games. Um, so the industry had gone to what I, uh, what I would say almost virtual collapse to we were lifting back up slowly. But at the same time, we get back to Gene Cunningham and his rental homes. Out of, I don't know the exact number, we'll just use a round number of 100 homes. The first inspection that came around, only less than 10 passed. 
And so Gene was now on a 30 day clock to get these rental homes back up to code. Well, after that initial 30 days, you know, maybe another five passed. Well, now he was having to shovel money into these rental homes trying to get them up to code. So now he had 60 days to get them up to code. He's shoveling money into these rental homes. And it, you also have to keep in mind, he leveraged, he borrowed against these homes to expand the compound where Illinois Pinball was. So he was in debt to the banks with not only, well, he also borrowed the money to uh, the 600000 to buy the uh, assets of uh, Williams Pinball. So he was in debt. Well, not only was he in debt, now he was having to borrow more money and shovel more money into these rental homes. And so we were making parts and we were getting things done, but at the same time, he still had Kim, his stepdaughter, who was not a business person, running Illinois Pinball. Uh, if any of you were ordering parts in the mid-2000s at Illinois Pinball, if you tried to call them, you got a busy signal 95% of the time. They had one line, they didn't even have call waiting, and Kim was a talker. She's probably one of the few people on this planet that could compete with me as far as being able to uh, make a short story long. She would talk on the phone. She would get somebody on the phone. It was rah, just continuous talking. I would take trips there, and she was out of an eight-hour day. She was probably on the phone five hours, and none of that was really for business. It was just gossip, talk, 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 talk. She was... And so nobody could call in for an order. And then they would say, fax an order in. People would fax orders in. They wouldn't get responses. Um, I saw boxes that were packed, ready to go, that were never shipped for whatever reason. It was just poorly run. Kim, bless her heart, she did not, she did not know how to run a business. Uh, she was just not equipped to do that. And Gene didn't want to bring an outsider in to do it. He had gotten burned by the Bear Cave guys, and he felt like he got burned by other people. So he did not trust somebody else to come in. And at the same time, his own family, Kim, was just not running the business. What was that? They, they, they did, at the beginning, they did not have a website. Uh, they did start a website. The Barricade guys are the ones that started a website. They really didn't maintain the website. Uh, if I recall, there was no shopping cart on the website in the beginning. Um, they didn't hire a true web designer to come in there and put a website together that was where you could um, order anything off of it efficiently. They didn't have an inventory. They never took an inventory of the parts, uh, which is uh, maybe if, as, as I go along, I'll, I'll get into a little bit of that at the end of it. But um, getting back to, and it was, it was really, in, uh, it was quite interesting when I would go there. I live in Atlanta, so it's a 10-hour drive, and sometimes I would fly in there. But I would go there frequently when I was getting tools, bringing parts to them uh, that I made off the tooling. To give you, it was sort of like a, a daycare center in a way. They had, they literally had a six by 10 cage in the warehouse next to the, to the desk where, they, where Kim had her grandchildren. And she was watching them at the same time. Her daughter was watching videos on the computer and Kim was on the telephone talking to somebody about what somebody said on, at that time, RGP, um, pre-pin side. 
So it was just poorly run. So getting back to Gene was shoveling money into rental homes and he was running out of money at a rapid pace. Uh, he was going further and further in debt. Uh, his part of the, the, the saving, the thing that would have saved him, the parts business, he still would not turn it over to somebody that could run it efficiently and make money off of it. He was losing money on the compound that he, that he built the many warehouses. He was upside down on that compound at approximately $3,000 a month. So that started the downfall of Illinois Pinball. So by the time 2009 rolls around, or 2008 rolls around, Gene Cunningham is broke. And the banks are now starting to uh, encircle him and start to put pressure on him about foreclosing on some of the properties. He was losing a, the, a lot of his rental homes were now being condemned. He could not rent them out, so he was no longer getting income from these students that were paying six, uh, four students would live in a house and he'd get $1,600 a month. I went to one of the uh, rental homes. Uh, one time I was staying up there, I was gonna stay for a week, and he says, I'll let you stay in one of the rental homes. And I said, okay, so like, we go over there and it's just all the carpets pulled up and I went into the bathroom and I'm standing in front of the toilet and there is a hole right in front of the toilet. And you look down and it's the crawl space. I'm like, okay, and then I look up and there is a hole in the ceiling and I'm looking through the hole in the ceiling and it goes to a hole that's in the roof. And so it was just, a hole from the roof through the ceiling all the way down to the crawl space. And so I said, I'll just stay at a hotel. So he, it was, those are the kind of houses he had. Um, so he, he, he lost all that revenue he was getting off of the rental homes. Yes, David. No, Gene did everything himself. Gene did not have a property manager doing any of the work. Um, Gene did not, Gene didn't trust people to do the work for him. Uh, he, he especially would not trust people with his money. So he, was, he, he started losing money hand over fist. 2008, he started, he, it, it was really closing in on him. And so he approached me about his financial, you know, how dire his financial situation was. And we put together, uh, he needed an immediate infusion of cash because if he didn't get it, they were gonna for start foreclosure on the compound where Illinois Pinball was. And so we came up with a game plan to have an open house sale and I don't know if any of you guys had a chance to do to go to it, um, but he had an open house, and it was, a, I believe, the only time he had really opened the doors fully uh, for um, people to come in and purchase off the shelves directly. And it gave him a little bit of money. Uh, one thing, that, and. and let me, let me go back to one part of Gene Cunningham that I failed to, to introduce about him. Gene did not just jump into the pinball business. Gene was an avid pinball collector. Before Illinois Pinball came along, he amassed a huge collection of pinball machines that he had at his house. Um, I forget the exact number. It was 500 plus pinball machines. He had a... a yeah, yeah, th but that over a thousand, I've seen some of those. Uh, those were pieces of games in some cases. <laughs> but uh, Gene was an avid collector. He had a huge pinball collection. That he had a building adjacent to his house, and, and some of you may have gotten the Gene tour, which was quite interesting. Gene was proud of his collection. He loved to tell the story behind every piece uh, that he had, he'd tell the story about a woman that 
uh, he would uh, buy a machine from and the background on it. So that was actually Gene's start into it. Well, let me jump back up to 2008. So we, we gave him a little infusion of cash from the, that sale, but it wasn't enough. I mean, Gene was literally, he was at the point, he was dropping, in, he was upside down $20,000 a month and he had no cash reserves whatsoever. Uh, so he asked me, uh, we had talked, and he asked me if th there was somebody that might be interested in, in a bulk buy of parts from, his, uh, from Illinois Pinball. So I asked, I was actually in communication with uh, some people in Australia at that time, and they were interested in buying a lot of parts, so I tried to put the two of them together. The problem was I asked Gene for an inventory of parts. They didn't have it. And so we went up there, a uh, friend of mine and Georgiana, his wife, and Kim, we tried to do an inventory and it was just so, uh, they just didn't have the means to do it. You can't do an inventory where you have 2,000 pieces and you have you don't have a counter, a, a weight counter, where you can put, uh, you, if people are familiar with that, you can put five on there, do a weight, and then punch in the number, and then dump the whole basket in there, and it'll tell you how many there are. No, you're having to do it one at a time. So after spending two weeks of doing that, it was a futile effort. Uh, they, they just, they were just not equipped to, to do an inventory. Uh, so early in 2009, Gene finally told me that he had to sell it or it was over. And at that, he was asking an exorbitant amount for the whole business. And I told him that number was just too high. And I made the comment, if you could get the number to X, I might be interested. Well, he finally said, well, X is a good enough number. So that's when I and him made the agreement that I would purchase the assets. And the assets all, uh, included uh, all the parts, all the archives that, when he got the assets from Williams, there were the documents, the archives, uh, the historic archives of Williams as well. So all that was included in the sale. So we worked out a deal uh, and the tooling was also involved, which is what I was really interested in because again, going back to my ramp business, uh, that's what I really wanted. I didn't really particularly care to be in the overall pinball business. Uh, that would have been an expansion that I would have had to have made and I really didn't really care for it. So I went back to the Australians and decided if I could take the parts and sell those off and basically have the tooling as, quote, the profit, the tooling along with the archives, which I love. I love the history of pinball. Um, if I could have that basically as the profit, I thought it was a win for everybody. So I approached the, the Australians, and eventually a deal was made where they were going to buy the parts uh, for pretty much what I was paying for the whole works. And... I would end up with the tooling, the archives. Gene would get his head above water, and Gene was going to retain a small portion of his business that included the intellectual property stuff, cabinet decals, plastic sets, trans lights, intellectual properties, the artwork kind of stuff. So he was going to retain that, so he would still remain in business, but on a very small scale, something I believe that he could have managed. But as things go with Gene Cunningham and business deals, things didn't go as expected. Um, and it ultimately led to uh, the deal souring, I'll put it that way. Um, and so instead of it being a smooth deal, Gene gets paid, the Australians get the parts, I get the tools, and everybody's happy. Um, I got some of the tools. 
I had to rescue the archives, uh, which is another story altogether. I'll do a seminar all on that by itself. Uh, and the Australians took off with the parts, and then um, it just, uh, to be brief, it fell apart. And then, of course, when things fall apart as they are want to do, uh, lawyers get involved. So for the next, from 2010 to 2013, it became a lawyer fest. Uh, and Jean, eventually filed for bankruptcy, uh, which was the completion of his downfall. So when he filed for bankruptcy, um, the bankruptcy trustee comes in and they take all the assets, of course, if anybody's witnessed a bankruptcy, the trustee comes in and they take an inventory of everything and they start liquidating. And eventually what happened they, Gene owned a skating rink, uh, which was part of his properties. Um, they took everything, and the banks foreclosed on all the real estate, um, and eventually including his house. Uh, they foreclosed on the compound where Illinois Pinball was, um, and he uh, eventually, everything real estate wise went to the banks and everything but his personal assets were rolled up and the trustee was going to sell them but then the trustee sent out word that they were going to take bids on the whole works you know all the assets and gene's assets included his shares of illinois pinball which was uh yeah, it was a s corporation so illinois pinball was not bankrupt Gene Cunningham was bankrupt. His shares of Illinois Pinball were part of his personal assets. So when they took the bids, um, I bid on it, uh, and Planetary Pinball bid on it, um, Matt and Rick. And Matt and Rick eventually uh, bought the assets, uh, which to me was a proper fit. Uh, I had talked to Matt and um, beforehand, and he was quite aware of the litigation that was going on between Gene and myself, and we agreed. It, Matt, uh, I don't know how many of you know Matt Cristiano of Planetary Pinball, but he is a really great guy. Uh, he is a smart business person, but he is very reasonable, and him and I, were able to sit down and uh, when he knew he was buying the shares of Illinois Pinball, i.e. he was getting Illinois Pinball, he was also buying my headache, as I, as I put it. So, and Matt is a, an affluent person in the, in the way that when we sat down the first time at the table, uh, the way I put it was, Matt, uh, you have enough money to kick my ass, but I have enough money to be a pain in the ass. So he eventually said, well, you know, it's best that let's just figure, work it out. And so I gave him a proposal that I felt would make a good long-term solution for everybody, which um, would allow him to take over all the injection tooling. I ended up with all the thermal forming tooling, which I had already got. And they ended up with all the assets, and that's how Matt and Rick and IE Planetary Pinball took over uh, Illinois Pinball. So that was the fall of it. Now, since then, Gene Cunningham uh, essentially lost everything. Uh, last year, he was evicted from his house is the building adjacent to his house where his pinball collection used to be. Matt got his pinball collection or what was left of it. Um, the building burned down um, and the banks finally foreclosed and he had to leave and so now Gene is living in one of the last rental homes that um, he still had 
through the bankruptcy. Um, basically, it was, uh, I think, one of the homes that the banks didn't even want. So he's living there. Uh, recently, he fell off a ladder and broke his hip and had surgery. Uh, so he's getting around. He's not in the best of health. Uh, but he, you know, Gene was, a lot of people that knew him would say that he was his own worst enemy. He was, any, you know, I could, I would agree with them. Um, I could give you my personal, inject my personal experiences, but that's not the purpose of why I wanted to talk about this. It was more, there's a lot of misinformation on forums about what happened with Gene, and I was, I worked very close with Gene from 2000, late 2004, all the way through 2010, and I got to see a lot of what was going on at that time, but also got the history of what was going on before then. And it, it really was a sad story because there was, it was a business that the assets that came from Illinois, uh, from Williams, if they were managed right, Gene would have retired and would have been able to, to ride off into the sunset successful. But unfortunately, there was a, a, um, a combination of events that took place that was his downfall and the downfall of Illinois Pinball. Yes, David. Two minutes? I thought you were saying peace. Wait, I got started late. You know, it's 358. Um, all right, Mike. I mean, David. <laughs> Questions, anybody? <laughs> Larry. No. No. Uh, they, it was funny at the expo that Gene, right after he got the assets, uh, when the contract was signed with Williams. If anybody was here at that expo, there was Gene, he had a booth at the expo. The only thing in the booth was a piece of paper that said, what parts would you like to see get made? And in the next room was Carrie Stair with a 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 booth selling just tons of NOS Williams parts. And so there was, it, it was, it struck me quite odd that here's the guy that bought Williams assets and then there's this guy in the next room just selling NOS parts hand over fist. Kerry didn't do anything wrong, don't get me wrong. Kerry had the parts, he got them legitimately, but Gene didn't have any parts, but he did have the big bang bar there at that time. Yeah, David. Oh, go ahead. David, he doesn't care. I did, uh, and, and Pat Lawler's next. I know nobody wants to hear him. Uh huh. No, he, he, he never, I, I, his, the, the only background that I really got from him was he was in the Navy, yeah, he got out of the Navy. I don't know what his job history was. Where I picked up his history was essentially where he was a property investment. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's about the only thing I got out of it. Um, are you talking about the software? No, I don't know where. 
I vaguely remember that. Now, I do have uh, a library of Williams CAD files, and I also have uh, some original eight inch floppy disk from the, but it was ballet stuff. I, uh, if you come over to our booth, I have a booth here. I have one of the folders from a game called Demolition that Greg Kumick uh, apparently was designing. Do you know anything about that, David? It's called Demolition. They called it Demolition, then I saw Demo Dog on there at some point. Uh, but I don't know if anything ever became of it. You ought to stop by and look in that folder. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. I know who ended up with those, except he, he didn't end up with a particular play field from all that. Uh, <clears throat> no, um, yeah, that'd be great if you, you ought to package that together and put it on a CD and distribute it. That'd be, that'd be cool. Yeah. Any other questions before David tells me I gotta go? Yes. So throughout this process of writing art to be transferred from Steve, Jane, Rick, uh huh. The various board units. Do you wear other things that got lost or the location you like Yeah, there's there's uh, again a whole number of the seminar about some of that. One thing that I did leave out was that, um, I forget what year it was, Planetary Pinball purchased the rights from Wayne. So when um, Wayne sold Planetary the rights, there was a, a, a new contract with Williams that was involved in that. And that's why now Planetary has control and police control over the rights uh, all intellectual properties, Williams related, which also ties into, of course, the Chicago Gaming remakes. Uh, they license Chicago Gaming to make those games. So when Planetary got the assets of William uh, from Gene, by that time, Williams had already canceled the contract with Gene. Uh, there's always a pro forma clause in a, in a contract. And so Williams had already sent Gene uh, a letter saying that their contract involving the intellectual property use was now being canceled. So when they bought the assets, i.e. the shares also of Illinois Pinball, there was really no rights involved in that. Planetary already had rights from the, the deal that they had when they purchased them from um, Wayne Gillard at Mr. Pinball. Any other questions? Good, we are done and Pat Lawler can come in and give his talk. Thank you very much. People.